Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. Since the dawn of time, civilizations have looked to the stars for guidance. The Egyptians used two stars that circled the celestial pole in order to build the pyramids. Sailors used the position of the stars in the sky in relation to the horizon to keep their ships on course. And even though we have some of the most advanced technology in the world to perform these calculations for us today, scientists and engineers still consult the night sky for unbelievable results. Many people don't know that the Earth wobbles. I'm not talking about earthquakes, though. This is something different. As the planet turns on one axis, it moves more slowly along another, completing one rotation along this secondary axis every 26,000 years. It's called the axial precession. A long time ago, architects built a monument to honor the men who had died building a massive structure. Two bronze statues sat elevated with 30-foot wings pointed straight at the sky. Some considered them to be angels, while others saw them as the best versions of ourselves watching over us. And below their massive feet was a celestial map, which had been etched into the surface using the position of the stars in relation to the Earth's axial precession. It was as much a work of art as it was a feat of engineering, and only an expert astronomer would have been able to create such a piece. Along the bottom of the map, two stars were highlighted, Thuban, the north star used by the ancient Egyptians, and Polaris, what we consider to be the north star today. These stars were encapsulated within a circle, the kind that might be drawn by the Earth as it turned on its axis over 26,000 years. And just outside that circle was another star, Vega, which will be our north star in roughly 12,000 years. But what made this map truly special was not its level of detail or artistry. It was that the architect who designed it was able to line up the celestial axis with Polaris on the exact day of the monument's commemoration. And look, I know that's a lot of visualization for you to attempt. I'm asking you to imagine something incredibly complex, and I get that. But if you ever have the chance, you can visit it, because the map is still in place. And it probably will be for another thousand years or more. After all, it's only 85 years old. To see it, you just need to visit the Nevada side of the Hoover Dam. The monument was erected to honor the 112 lives lost during the dam's construction. The celestial map was the creation of Norwegian sculptor Oscar J.W. Hansen, who designed it as a way for astronomers to deduce the exact date of the dam's dedication by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That way, if all records were destroyed there would still be this map to use as a means of calculation. The map also provides a way to calculate the precession of the pole star for the next 14,000 years. And as if that weren't enough, the techniques used by Hansen to create his map are currently being used in another modern marvel, the Clock of the Long Now. Also known as the 10,000-year clock, this 500-foot-tall clock was the brainchild of inventor Danny Hills in 1986. The full-size version will be built within a mountain in Texas and run for 10,000 years. It will be powered by manual winding, like a simple watch, but will store energy from temperature changes in order to keep running between windings. Aside from the standard time and date, the 10,000-year clock will also track the phases of the moon, the position of the stars and planets, and calculate the precession of the Earth's axis, just like Hansen's celestial map. And if you want to see it, there's a working prototype of the clock on display at the Science Museum in London. It's a lot smaller than the real clock will be, but even at such a tiny scale, it works exactly as advertised. It came to life on New Year's Eve in 1999, just in time to ring in the new millennium. And I know what you're thinking. Will the full-size clock live up to its name and actually run for another 10,000 years? And the answer, as you might imagine, is fairly simple. Only time will tell.
When we think of cursed objects, we think of items that have been stolen from sacred places, such as King Tut's golden sarcophagus or the Hope Diamond. These objects have been long rumored to bring deadly misfortune to all who came in contact with them. For example, Egyptologist Howard Carter, the man responsible for opening Tut's tomb, died of blood poisoning five months later after an unfortunate mosquito bite. But 20 years after Carter's demise, another curse arose, thousands of miles away from the Egyptian pyramids. It was caused by a sphere, about three and a half inches in diameter. It was comprised of two halves of plutonium gallium, held together in the middle by a ring. It was the 14-pound core of a devastating nuclear device. The plan was to drop this new bomb on Japan on August 19th, but the country surrendered four days earlier and brought World War II to an end. The core, however, was still ready to go. On August 25th, a physicist named Harry Dalian was performing tests on the core at a facility in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Harry had worked on the Manhattan Project and was stacking reflective bricks made of tungsten carbide around the sphere. With each brick he placed, neutrons would bounce off of them and then back at the core. Henry would then use the neutron reflections to gauge how close the core was to going supercritical. Harry was by himself while he was performing these tests, save for the lone security guard sitting several feet away. As he stacked the bricks, one slipped and fell onto the core, releasing a lethal dose of radiation into the air. He pulled out the brick, but it was too late. He'd taken the brunt of the blast and died of radiation poisoning less than a month later. One year after that accident, physicist Louis Slotin was showing a few other Los Alamos scientists how to properly handle the core. He'd done it several times before, and had become known as an expert around the facility. Instead of using bricks like Harry, though, Louis placed two halves of a beryllium shell around the core to act as a neutron reflector. The only catch was that the shell could not be allowed to seal completely. If it did, the core would go supercritical and unleash a wave of radiation. Louis was supposed to use shims to keep the halves separate, but he liked to live on the edge. His preferred method was a screwdriver wedged in between the hemispheres. One day, while shadowed by a pupil named Alvin C. Graves, Louis placed his screwdriver on the bottom half and then lowered the top half down over the core. But the screwdriver slipped, and the shell closed around the core completely, sealing it in, and within a heartbeat, it went supercritical. A blast of blue light washed over Louis as he wedged the screwdriver back in to separate them. But by then, it was too late. Louis had absorbed almost all of the radiation given off by the core. He died a week and a half later. After this second incident, no one else ever handled the sphere directly again. Any tests that had been planned for it were postponed until it was less radioactive. In the end, they had to invent new equipment to handle it, including machines that could be operated from a quarter mile away. TV cameras would broadcast everything to the scientists operating those machines so that they could see what they were doing. It was a lot of work to keep up the studies, though, and soon enough the project was cut. The Demon Core, as it had come to be known, was eventually melted down and incorporated into other nuclear devices. Most people see these tragic deaths as the unfortunate consequences of breaking the rules. The rules of the lab and the rules of physics. But some see the Demon Core as a warning. After all, they claim, that much power was simply never meant to be possessed. Stripped of its modern decorations, though, it's easy to think that Howard Carter would have had a different word for it. A curse. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.